All right, everyone, let's get started. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Sang Wee Jun. He's a assistant professor in the computer science department here at UCI. He's uh, one of our new faculty members. We're very excited to have him. So this is the second week you're hearing from our new faculty and learning about their exciting research. Uh, his research in, is on building efficient systems for big data analytics, and he got his PhD from MIT. So without further ado, <coughs> tell us what you're doing. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to be standing here giving this talk. Uh, I'm Sang Woo Chan. I'm, like you said, I'm a newly, very fresh assistant professor who joined like a month ago. <coughs> uh, today, I'll be giving a talk on my research, Cheaper and Faster Computers, Affordable Big Data Analytics Using Hardware, one, hardware accelerators, and two, NVM storage. But uh, to continue the tra tradition of last week, a little bit about me first. My name is Sang Woo Chan. Uh, I finished my PhD at MIT this year, actually a few months ago. Uh, my research interests are typically in, mostly in system architecture, and I do everything hands-on. Everything I build actually, actually has to physically manifest, so there's nothing, no questions whether it, I'm cutting corners, basically. And I also do research in accelerators, FPGA accelerators and whatnot, also hands-on. Uh, and NVM storage, right now I'm mostly focusing on NAND flash storage devices. <coughs> And of course, applications that run on these new systems that I built. The photo here is uh, our demo that we did a couple of years ago on uh, n-body simulations <coughs> of uh, galaxy particles, which was cool. The, the most fun part of doing this was building the 3D renderer, which is saying something. Uh, I managed to get some nice papers during my PhD career in some of the pretty good conferences. And thankfully, I was recognized a little bit on media coverage as well. If you Google my name, there's few articles. <laughs> and, uh, not many. <laughs> and uh, this is sort of tangential, but for some of you who know uh, this game called Maple Story, I used to be I used to work on that company before I joined MIT. So maybe if you played this game between 2005 and now, you ran some of my code. <laughs> uh, and first of all, I'll uh, try to give a little bit of uh, background on. A computer, some history. Uh, first of all, because I love talking about computer history. Second of all, uh, for a lot of you, this might be not new, but to get everyone on the same page on, on what I do and why I do it. <coughs> Traditionally, the abstract model of a computer had a CPU and a memory. They, they were connected to each other. Memory had programs and data on it, and they would just happily chug along. CPU loads memory as fast as I can. They run software as fast as I can. And things look good up until something like mid-2000s. Clock frequencies became faster every year. Uh, processor density became faster every year, a uh, bit denser every year. CPUs became faster every year. Memory capacity was becoming <coughs> larger at exponential speeds. And there seems to be there seemed to be no reason that this would not continue. And it was good time to write software. Some soft, same software ran faster on this on bigger data sets tomorrow, next year, because we'll, by next year we'll have better computers. And to be honest, this is not the most exciting time to be, was not the most exciting time to be a computer architect because no one would pay attention to the wonderful new computer architecture you will build because why should I care? Next year is gonna, my, my, I can just go out and buy, I'm a, buy a better computer from Amazon for the same price anyways. And people were so optimistic about this that uh, charts like this were drawn. Uh, this projection was made back in 2000, the year 2000 Processor uh, fro clock frequency scaling was expected to go on exponentially forever. And according to this chart, we should be around here. Uh, where is my 50 gigahertz processor? I don't have one. <laughs> Why don't we have one? It's because we ran into the power wall. Uh, uh, around same time, around 2000, people discovered that as we make processors more dense and more high clock frequency, we weren't able to maintain the low power density of processors like we used to. So as processors became faster, and this revelation came around the time we had Pentium 4s, uh, if we continue scaling at this speed, pretty soon we're going to reach the thermal density of a nuclear reactor on our CPUs, uh, and then go on to the sun's surface, which is, uh, yeah, if we, right now we are at seven nanometers uh, trans transistor size. So at seven nanometers, we're pretty much around rocket nozzle size. <laughs> so, so as a comparison, back in the age, age of um, Intel 3, uh, 386 processors, we didn't need a heat sink or a fan or anything because the uh, 
the power density of CPUs are so low. Uh, this, this photo is the one I took yesterday of my computer running an i7. I have two fans and a gigantic thermal sink, but no amount of thermal sink is going to help you cool your nuclear reactor on your machine. <laughs> so what do we do? So compared to what we projected back in 2000s, every year as we try to do new projections on what's going to happen, the clock frequency scaling projections kept, uh, came down gradually. So what are you going to do? <clears throat> the processor were, processors clock speeds weren't getting any faster. But Moore's law was still continuing, and every year we had more pro uh, transistors on the same uh, chip to use. So people went the way of multi-cores. And because the clock frequency didn't scale anymore, we just had more, more cores on the same processor, we managed to turn around slightly before we reached nuclear reactor levels of heat dissipation. And, and so that was good for a while. We had to write, rewrite a little bit of software, but we were still using things like the x86 assembly uh, at the bottom. So it looked sort of okay. And people, again, became sort of optimistic. And this was the projection that was made in, what, 2007. And people uh, suspected that as Moore's Law just kept continuing and uh, we get more and more cores, getting more and more processing power, by the time 2018, where is my 150 core processor? <laughs> I'm seeing a pattern here. So it's not only processors that's causing us uh, woes. Memory and storage worries as well. This is the chart that I had on the very first uh, slide. Um, it was good until, like many other things, until something, somewhere around mid-2000s. And then, oh no, this is a logarithmic scale chart. So that slight amount of dip is actually very large. So per gigabit process, back in 2013, we were, we were saying things like per gigabit price of DRAM used to be $11 per gigabit in 2006, but now in 2013, it's an order of magnitude cheaper, $1 per gigabit, which is still sort of true in 2018. We are still about at about $1 per gigabit. So DRAM isn't getting any cheaper. We can, you can, of course, pay more money to buy more DRAM, but it's not, the technology isn't scaling as fast as they used to. But uh, DRAM bandwidth is sort of increasing, but not as fast. This is the green line is for DRAM. This is, again, you know, this is, they're still increasing at a sort of an exponential scale, but with a very, very low scale exponential scale. Compared to that, uh, storage is getting faster pretty quickly, although this chart comes from uh, Western Digital, so claims for infinite storage bandwidth should be taken with a grain of salt. <laughs> so in light of both of these, and the fact that processing requirements are still increasing exponentially, should I go home and cry? Should I go home and drink some soju and, you know, be sad? <laughs> As an example, uh, the Department, Ener Department of Energy back in 2016 requested a exaflop machine by the year 2020. Exaflop would be a billion, billion floating po point instructions per second. If we, if we had built this machine using the 2016 technologies, the power consumption of the entire cluster would have taken something like 200 megawatts. To put that into perspective, this is the MIT Research Nuclear Reactor. This is the only nuclear reactor that is situated inside a residential area. <laughs> this generates six megawatts. <laughs> so it's a little bit too much power. Of course, I'm cheating a little bit because the MIT research reactor, there are much bigger nuclear reactors out there, like to hundreds and thousands of megawatts. But to, this puts things into perspective a little bit. So is this, you know, is this a sad state of things? I don't think so, because challenge begets innovations. From my point of view, classical scaling of, of processor and DRAM performance and whatnot have run into the wall of many walls, actually. End of Moore's Law, end of Dennard scaling, end of Wang's Law, and many other laws that have people's names on it. And what's happening, seems to be happening, is that there's new technologies, new architectures, and new many things that would not have been of interest to other people as if classical scaling had continued. So it's good for us, for architects. For example, uh, GPUs from uh, NVIDIA building a general purpose uh, graphic processing units for computation claim that we are going to still have exponential performance scaling on GPUs as opposed to CPUs. 
And they claim 1,000 times performance by 2015, which is a little bit suspect, but it's, it's good as, that it's continuing right now. FPGA capacity trends are continuing, at also an exponential trend. Most of these, I suspect, will end at some point, but it's, it's still going on. And uh, flash bit density trends is still also including, uh, increasing exponentially. <coughs> So there are many moving parts, there are many new moving parts in system research right now, and there's many, many interesting questions that need to be answer, answered. What are the best algorithms that to, to, to run on these new uh, components, devices, and technologies? What are the best programming abstractions to use GPUs and PGAs in uh, high coarse granularity storage devices? What are the best system architectures to use this in? And what are the best OS architectures to not get in the way? And uh, to sort of more emphasize the point, the modern computer, uh, a modern computer is not as simple as what I had in the beginning of the presentation. We have CPUs and memory, of course. We may have GPUs connected over PCIe or something to memory. We, have, we may have FPGAs connected to PCI over memory. Maybe FPGAs would be better connected as a cache coherent accelerator to the CPU. Maybe NVMs would be connected over PCI to memory. Maybe NVMs would be better if they're connected to CPU over a cache coherent interface. Maybe FPGAs would be better if they're connected to the network interface card because of some ap applications, there are distributed applications that require this. Maybe we need more than one GPUs, and maybe GPUs need to talk to each other directly because that would be faster. Maybe FPGAs need to be embedded into the NVM storage devices because all data comes from there anyways. Maybe NICs need to be con uh, connected to the CPU in a cache query interface. All of these questions, uh, all of these choices may have an order of magnitude, 10 times, 100 times performance implications on the, uh, depending on the application that you're running. So I would say there's no time, this is not my words. This, these words come from David Patterson on his Turing Award lecture uh, this year. There's no, time, no better time to be an architect Quote unquote, there are Turing Awards waiting to be picked up if people would just work on these things, accelerators on applications. Uh, aim for the stars, I guess. <laughs> so yes, in light of all of this, enough with the hype. Uh, so what am I doing in relation to all of this? I'm building, uh, like the title said, cheaper and faster computers using new storage technologies and new computation technologies. An interesting application that I'm looking at right now is in personalized genome. With the advancement of uh, genome sequencing technologies, it is now possible for, say, a cancer patient to use a next generation sequencing machine to have his normal healthy cells genomes and the tumoral uh, genomes. It's cheap to do it, as opposed to, uh, compared to a few years ago. And these two things can be compared cross reference to each other to discover the potential cancer causing mutations, which can in turn be used to create efficient cancer treatment therapies, which, is, which would be good. This is actually uh, published work from some of our collaborators at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And the algorithm involved in doing this is sort of complex, because the algorithm is sort of complex, and there's terabytes of data per patient that's going, that, that needs to be randomly accessed and processed. They are running this algorithm on their, this is actually the, uh, the photo of their cluster, 16 machines, two terabyte total of DRAM. And for each patient, they're running this one algorithm for six hours, up to six hours. My goal right now, uh, this research is actually ongoing, is to replace all of this with these. A PCI attached flash storage device coupled with a application specific accelerator using an FPGA without losing performance. And right now I'm collaborating with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center to make sure that the algorithm that we implement isn't, is actually still true. And Samsung, which, because they're sort of interested in actually putting these accelerators into their production SSDs. The, I think we'll start having numbers in a couple of months, which is exciting. So it might sound a little bit too good to be true. 16 node cluster, two ter terabyte of DRAM replaced with two terabyte of flash on sitting on my laptop. But I know that something like this can definitely be done but based on my success experience with some, some important applications, including graph analytics with billions of vertices and key value caches uh, <coughs> servicing millions of users. All of the experiments were run using, uh, com by comparing a desktop class machine with an FPGA and PCI attached flash storage. This is actually a uh, uh, custom design PC from the PCB level up flash storage device that we have built, it was annoying to build, 
but it's cool. Uh, and by comparing the performance of these things, this, this cheap machine against a much costlier server class or cluster machines. And for graph <laughs> analytics, we managed to demonstrate 10x performance in some algorithms on some graphs while consuming less than a third of power compared to the more expensive machines. For key value caches, uh, we were able to get comparative performance compared to expensive machines at one-fifth the power consumption. Uh, since I don't have multiple hours to talk about everything, I will mostly focus on the graph analytics work, which was my most recent work, so that's, so there's that. So, <clears throat> first I will go a little bit into very shallow details about flash storage and its challenges and hardware accelerators using FPGAs. Uh, then I'll finally get to talk about graph analytics, and then if I have time, I will go a little bit into the architecture of this BlueDBM uh, cluster machine that we have built to do architecture exploration <coughs> on clusters of FPGs. Right, uh, flash storage so for <coughs> analytics. Because uh, big data analytics applications typically require fine-grained irregular access into data, it's sort of given that this data has to sit on main memory as opposed to storage, faster main memory. But because uh, some of the pro problems that we're interested in right now involve terabytes of data, which would mean we would have, we would require terabytes of DRAM. You can go out and buy a terabyte of DRAM right now, but they're expensive. You can go out and buy a terabyte of DRAM right now for about $8,000 per terabyte, I think. Market forces have driven this <laughs> price up a little bit in, the, in, the, in recent times. And your memory system will consume about 200 watts of power. I would like to replace all of that with a PCI attached flash storage device, which is much cheaper something like $500 per terabyte if you're buying a single device and mm -hmm. consumes about 10 watts under load. But there are challenges to using flash storage in uh, analytics because not only because there is a bandwidth differential, as you can see, but because the more fundamental issues is in, in its access granularity. Flash can be accessed in uh, granu very coarse granularities of pages about in, in the order of multiple kilobytes, as opposed to DRAM, which can be accessed in uh, granularities of cache lines, which is hundreds of bytes. And if you, if you load a large granularity data just to use a little bit of it, you end up wasting a lot of performance with a lot of write or read application. If you load an eight kilobyte page just to use eight bytes of it, then you're basically throwing a thousand times bandwidth away, which, is, which basically just kills your performance, and it's demonstrated in many database applications as well. So there's, that was that. Uh, the second component of the system is reconfigurable hardware acceleration using uh, field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. FPGAs are integrated circuit chips that can be programmed to act as application specific hardware. They are very high perform. They are high performance while consuming low power. Compared to GPUs, uh, FPGAs typically this depends on the application and how you program it, but and and the uh, and how it's integrated into the system. Typically, FPGAs are able to de uh, deliver similar class performance to GPUs at a much better power efficiency. But it's, as you can see on the flexi flexibility side, as of now, it's sort of more difficult to program. And as opposed to just going to TSMC and fapping out your, uh, fapping out your, uh, your ASIC, it's the on FPGA, once you buy one, you can reconfigure it if your application changes, which is a big plus. These good things, that's good characteristics why, are why many companies, including Amazon, Amazon now has FPGAs in their clusters, Microsoft Azure has FPGAs in actually all of their cluster machines right now, and ever since uh, Intel bought Altera, the second largest FPGA manufacturer, uh, they are working on things including a heterogeneous multi-core with Xeon cores and FPGA cores, which is cool. So now that we have that out of the way, I can finally jump into the application, example application. Large graphs are found everywhere. Lots of things can be represented as graphs. For example, the structure of neurons in the human brain, the structure of the internet, machines in a network, social networks, all these interesting kind of things. Uh, graphs of interest range from typically terabytes to hundreds of terabytes in size. And graphs are, real world graphs are typically notoriously very sparse because each vertex only connects to a handful of vertices, it typically, if you think of social networks, for example, and they're very irregular. You can't, there's really no pattern. You can't expect which vertex will be connected to which other vertex. 
So because of these characteristics, very large, very irregular, it's very difficult to handwrite efficient distributed or parallelized graph analytics software. That's why if you want to do complex graph analytics, uh, people typically use distributed graph analytics or non-distributed graph analytics software, uh, which provides a certain graph uh, analytics uh, uh, um, model, and you program your algorithm according to that model. And there are many, many models out there. Um, one of the more uh, prominent graph analytics models out there right now is the vertex-centric graph analytics model, which uh, was first introduced by Google. Uh, in vertex-centric graph analytics model, uh, your graph al algorithms are deconstructed into what is called a vertex program, which can only see and modify its immediate neighbors. And the algorithm is executed in terms of disjoint iterations. And in one iteration, the vertex uh, program will be run on all or subset of the vertices in your graph. And uh, in, in, in your graph. And this continues until you reach some sort of an uh, end condition. So for example, if these two <coughs> vertices are active vertices, the vertices on which your vertex program will be executed in this iteration, one vertex looks at its immediate neighbors, updates its values, another, neighbor, uh, another vertex up, looks at its neighbors and updates its values, and at the next iteration, the vertex values will be updated. It's a simple model, easy to, relatively easy to parallelize and distribute. That's why many systems are using it. Uh, if you uh, try to do algorithmic representation of the vertex <coughs> programming model, it sort of looks like this. For each, and I swear this is uh, like one of, one of the two uh, formulas that I'm going to show you today. Uh, for each active vertex in an active list, we iterate over all of its neighbors. And for each neighbor, we execute the user-defined uh, program on its outbound edges and on the destination vertex. These edge program and the vertex update, and there are many names for these two functions, are the user-provided programs that represent your graph analytics algorithm. The problem here is that because we can't predict, or, uh, and there's irregularity in uh, the, the distribution of the neighboring vertices, uh, running this nested for loop involves a lot of random access into vertices, uh, into vertex data, the current algorithmic vertex data. Because <clears throat> even when graphs are close to each other topographically, typically they are not close to each other in terms of memory layout, which, in, which basically removes uh, spatial locality. Oops. Right, sorry. And even across uh, multiple active vertices, the, the neighboring vertex sets across active vertices are pretty much uh, independent from each other, which means the access patterns become pretty much truly random. And even though sometimes you end up visiting some vertices that you visited before, the size and irregularity of the graph and the algorithm uh, limits caching effectiveness. So there's pretty much no temporal locality going on either. So caching basically doesn't work. So what does that mean? Does that mean we require large capacity DRAMs to store your entire graph in memory to get performance? Otherwise, <coughs> suffer if you try to go to storage, you suffer the thousand-fold performance degradation. I wouldn't be giving this talk if that was true. <coughs> So let's first try to uh, uh, represent the problem of vertex updates into a, a general problem of irregular array updates. We are updating an array x, which is where the vertex data is stored, with a stream of update request xs, which is a result of the two for loops, and an update function f, which would be the vertex update function. <coughs> so it will look like this. The update request has a vertex <coughs> index and a argument. Uh, which is the result of the edge program. And we use the update function on the current value of the vertex and the argument. And this results in, of course, random updates because the distribution of the index is irregular. The first part of the solution is to just, is simple. It's simple uh, simply just to sort the entirety of the update request and then sort it. And then now we'll have sequential updates, and which puts a lower bound on how much uh, access we're going to do into x, because if, in the worst case, we'll do it from beginning to end once. So this is sort of good. It's much better than doing naive random updates and suffering a thousand-fold performance degradation. But of course, because terabyte-scale graphs can generate terabyte-scale logs, this is still a significant amount of sorting overhead. So this is where the second part of the solution comes in, re reduction. If the associate function, uh, the update function f is 
binary associative, for example, addition is binary associative, then F can be interleaved with the sorting operation. For example, I filled the excess up with some, some random information and we're at the second phase of sorting because two things, uh, we're, we're sorted in pairs right now. Uh, and we're going to iteratively merge sort this, this, this excess. And every time you run into a vertex index collision, we're going to see two uh, adjacent vertex up, uh, update requests with, to the same vertex index, we're going to merge them. We're going to apply the update function f in place, which reduces overhead in terms of the amount of data you're going to write to the storage, the amount of data you're going to read from storage in the next iteration as well. And you can continue this uh, as sorting goes on. And there's actually significant reduction in overhead. So how can you use this to remove random access from graph analytics? Remember the problem was that we're going to, we had to do uh, uh, random access into destination vertices. So instead of applying it right now inside the for loop, I'm just going to log them into a list, which would become xs, and then you can apply sort reduce to it. There's no more random access. So there's a little bit of overhead. There's, of course, significant overhead by doing this instead of doing uh, updates in place in fast random access memory. So in order to see how well it does, we actually have to implement it and run it. But there is fairly big benefits from interleaving reduction with a uh, sorting operation. Uh, for example, in the graph 500 uh, Kronecker scale 32 synthetic graph, as the merge sort iteration goes on, uh, there's actually a significant amount of overhead that gets reduced as a result of this. And for uh, <coughs> at least in the case of one real world graph that we tested, the web data commons web crawl graph, the amount of data that needs to be sorted was reduced by over 90% in the first stage of uh, merge sort uh, phases, first merge sort phase, um, before the data was written to the flash for the very first time. And this pattern continues for many of the graphs that we've tested. So initially, we built a software implementation of a sort reduce, of the sort reduce algorithm. Uh, it, we, I wanted as much bandwidth as possible, so it was multi-threaded. It had a very high fan end to reduce merge sort passes, each sorter was run in, ran in a separate thread as to not become the bottleneck. Inter uh, thread communication happened in large chunks to reduce overheads. In, in the end, all in all, I tried to do my best because I thought this software implementation was going to be the thing. The problem was, uh, because we are using CPU threads to do merge sort, the performance ended up getting bottlenecked by the last level sorter, which capped, its, capped out its performance to something like one gigabyte per second, which is expectable sort of. If you imagine three gigahertz processor uh, almost with, n if you imagine a three gigahertz processor with no bubbles, no pipeline bubbles, and if every single instruction was a four byte write, and then, then you get 12 gigabytes per second. It's, it's sort of an expectable number because you need if loop, uh, if statements, you need for loop, stuff like that. And because the uh, index argument pair was fairly large, uh, fairly wide, uh, typically eight bytes or even 12 or 24 bytes, it limited the effectiveness of SIMD operations on the CPU. And of course, because each sorter tree spawned many threads, eight or 16 threads to do this work, it limited the total number of sort reduced merge, uh, sort reduced thread, sort reduced uh, 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 instances that were allowed on each machine. 32 cores, maybe four instances, that was it. So FPGAs to the rescue, uh, we designed and implemented a high throughput hardware merge sorter using some novel sorting network, network techniques. It was fairly excited, exciting when we first came up with this. Uh, that could take in a very wide array of values and sort and emit very wide arrays of values every cycle. Uh, at a relatively low clock, clock frequency we were running this on, we were merge sorting at about four gigabytes per second. And of course we can spawn more of these things. So that was sort of cool. So we built this hardware accelerated graph analytics platform that was storing and accessing all data in uh, PCIe flash storage. And we were using FPGAs to uh, do the actual analytics. So we compared it against other systems. Uh, there's three classes of system in-memory system, which expects the entirety of the graph data to sit inside memory and not in storage. Semi-external systems that expects most of data to not fit inside memory, but there's a uh, hard lower bound in which 
the amount of memory that you need. And third is the external analytic systems that, uh, that don't fail uh, if, you do, if you have very small amounts of memory, but the performance goes down gradually. Uh, our system, which we call Graph Boost, fits in the third category. So the evaluation environment. First, we set up a desktop class machine, a four core i5, four gigabytes of DRAM, one terabyte of PCIe flash. And we plugged it, it cost about $600 for us to buy, including the PCIe flash. And then we plugged in a Kintec 7 FPGA with one gigabyte onboard DRAM, cost about $1,700 to buy. It's, it's actually more expensive than the machine. And we ran two graphs, the Web Data Commons web crawl, web crawl graph. Uh, the text capacity was about two terabytes, three billion vertices, 128 billion edges, and the Graph 500 synthetic Kronecker uh, graph, which was about half a terabyte in textual capacity. For more vertices, four billion vertices, but less edges, 32 billion edges. So you ran all these, ran all these systems on this system using these graphs. Right, we, for example, we ran bread first search on the, the Web Data Commons web crawl graph. Graph Boost was able to finish in about, let's say, a bit more than 1,200 seconds. Graph Lab ran out of memory. Flash Graph ran out of memory. Xtreme didn't finish in time in a couple of days. Graph <laughs> Chi didn't finish in a couple of days. OK, maybe I was being a bit unfair, because we were using a $600 machine with a $1,700 uh, FPGA. None of these other systems are using the FPGA. So different evaluation environment. We have the old machine from before and a new system with a 16-core uh, Xeon, 32 threads, 128 gigabytes of memory, and 2.5 terabytes of PCI flash. This machine cost us about $9,000, $10,000 for us to buy. Second system is a five-node cluster, total of 60 cores, 128 <coughs> threads of Xeons, 240 gigabytes of uh, total memory, $10,000 for us to buy. So Graph Boost was going to run on the left side machine. All the other systems were going to run on the right side machines, whichever one they can run in. The cluster machine was typically for Graph Lab because this was the only system that we tested that was distributed. So much more expensive machines and much cheaper machines. So let's look at the first graph, the synthetic scale 32 connector graph, <laughs> half a terabyte in size, 4 billion vertices. Graph Lab again ran out of memory, 128 gigabytes, 240 gigabytes wasn't enough. Flash Graph ran out of memory because, again, same issues. Graph Chi also did not finish, same issues. But wait. One, one other system did finish. Xtreme did finish on PageRank, Red for Search, and between the centrality that we ran, the performance is normalized to the fully software implementation of Graph Boost that we did, which we call Graph Soft. And we do better on <coughs> our $2,000 machine compared to the $10,000 machine that the other system is running on by actually a significant margin up to 10x, depending on the algorithm. So that's, we finally have some number. It was, it's not just us compared to everyone else failing. <laughs> so OK, next graph. Uh, Web Data Commons graph, which was the biggest real world graph that we could find online. Two terabytes in size, three billion vertices. Graph Lab, again, ran out of memory. Graph Cheat, usual story, did not finish. But two systems did not fail this time, because I guess the ver number of vertices were much smaller. Uh, uh, the new system, Flashgraph SD1, actually managed to finish and does actually fairly well compared to our systems even, except for one algorithm. But the system that had, that actually managed to finish on the other graph, uh, Xtreme, doesn't finish at this po in, in this graph, probably because of the, because uh, Xtreme doesn't handle too many edges very well. So the takeaway from this is that the only, that only graph boost succeeds in both graphs and Graph Boost can still, still run larger graphs because like in the uh, first unfair test that we did, <coughs> Graph Boost can handle four terabyte, eight terabytes, 10 terabyte graphs without problem. We will have gradual decrease in performance, but it won't fail. And I, I understand that this, even this is sort of an apples to oranges comparisons because we had to gradually increase the cost of the machines that we we're testing against until we actually managed to get some number. So maybe the true takeaway from this is, is Graph Boost running on a $2,000 machine is sort of kind, of sort of kind of similar with other systems running on a $10,000 machine. I have a quick yes. question. So do you have any ideas how much, how, uh, how much memory do we need for Graph Lab to not run out of memory, or how much resources for GraphG to finish? GraphG, I'm not sure, because GraphG is almost entirely bound by disk and flash performance. Uh, and there's a lot of 
uh, write amplification going on. It, it probably it's going to take a long time unless you have a really, really powerful flash array. Uh, graph lab with the two terabyte graph, you probably need four terabytes of DRAM. So what was the setup that GraphTube was using? Like in the same uh, in, in their own evaluation. Uh, they were using a laptop. Their their graph was basically their so the graph was smaller. That's graph was smaller, smaller, and they were basically saying that it finishes at all, which is which was very new at the time. So because GraphLab hasn't shown any numbers so far, we actually tested against a much smaller graph to see what kind of performance it can get on the kind of graphs that it can run on. So we ran a, on a synthesized Kronecker graph of scale 28, which is about 90 gigabytes in size, about an order of magnitude smaller than the Kronecker 32 graph that we ran, including 0.3 billion vertices. And if we run GraphLab on a five-node cluster, it actually does fairly well. It does better than everyone else, which sort of justifies, I guess, our maybe cost, uh, just justifies our cost, because it's doing something like, compared to Graph Boost, it's doing something like two to three times faster on a three to four times fast, uh, more expensive machine, which maybe sort of makes sense. But on the other hand, oh, this was for PageRank, which has sort of regular patterns in network traffic. But if you ran, when we ran, uh, breadth first search, which has a much more irregular, much more fine-grained network access characteristics, performance goes down, probably because of network overheads. So take from that what you will. Oops. Graph Boost also reduces <coughs> resource requirements significantly, which allowed us to run it on the des desktop class machine. On the best conventional machines, uh, for example, Graph Lab, uh, no, not Graph Lab, a uh, flash graph running on the uh, 128 gigabyte machine, it was taking up to uh, 80 gigabytes to run uh, page rank on the web, web data commons graph. As opposed to, by doing external analytics, graph boost required maybe two gigabytes of DRAM. In terms of thread counts on the CPU that's required, uh, <coughs> the flash graph did best. It was using up to 32 threads, which was the total capacity of the machine that we had. Graph Boost, the Graph Soft machine and software implementation required 16 threads to max out our uh, flash storage device bandwidth. But with hardware acceleration, it's down to two threads because it's doing nothing but uh, management. In terms of power, uh, 720 watts comes from the five node cluster that you're running using a uh, wall wattage, wall plug wattage uh, monitor. <coughs> If you use instead if the 30, 128 gigabyte machine instead of a cluster, the power consumption goes down for conventional systems, which is a benefit of using single node uh, flat, uh, flash storage based systems. But by using external analytics and hardware acceleration, GraphBoost was made, managed to bring it down to 160 watts. And this isn't the whole story, because the, even the PC that we were running wasn't actually running at 100% capacity. It, was, it wasn't using all the threads. It was idle most of the time. So if we can swap it out with a much more compact embedded class machine, which has a much lower uh, power envelope, maybe you can bring it down to 80 watts, which is one fifth the power consumption. And now this is stretching it a little bit, but if we, the accelerator that we used has a lot of um, unnecessary things going on <coughs> for expandability. Expandability. So maybe if we just manage to, if we can get Samsung to plug in the plug in an FPGA chip by itself into their SSD devices, we can bring in, bring down the power consumption of the device to maybe 10 watts, which brings it down further, which is which would be pretty cool if you can actually manage it. So that was um, I have what five minutes left. That was the graph. I did not talk about Key Valley Cache, but if anyone is interested, I can talk about this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, because I have five minutes, I will quickly go through the BlueDBM cluster that we have built to do this kind of uh, architecture exploration platform. Uh, this exists back in MIT. Uh, we built a custom flashcard that we have here for distributed accelerate, accelerated flash architectures. Initially, we wanted to do a transaction database acceleration using this card. So it, it, when we were building this card, it had three uh, requirements. The first one, was we, we, we had to be able to modify flash management. We had to get, be able to get rid of the flash translation layer if you wanted. We had to be able to 
change error correcting codes if he wanted. So instead of having a vendor supplied flash man management chip, we put a small FPGA on this card so we can implement our own things, which took a lot of time but was fun. The second requirement was that uh, to, to cut down overhead, of course, power consumption and cut down latency into flash storage because those things add a lot of latency. The second requirement was that we needed to be able to do a dedicated storage area network between the storage devices directly without having to go through the host because that also adds a lot of latency and bandwidth overheads in terms of going through the operating system and go, in terms of going through <coughs> interrupts and whatnot. So we added a uh, intercontroller network, which was actually uh, per lane about it's actually 20 gigabits per second per lane by four, but yes, it was quite fast and low latency. The third requirement we used was that we wanted to do an in-storage hardware accelerator, uh, which we did by uh, making it such that this thing can plug into a uh, off-the-shelf FPGA accelerator card, and pretty high bandwidth between it and that as well. So with these cards, we built a 20-node cluster. In each node, we had a Vertex 7 FPGA, which is D707, uh, and two of these cards connected to it, which added up to one terabyte of flash storage per node. Uh, the, the storage device itself was plugged into a host PC, uh, which over PCIe Gen 2 by 8 at eight gigabytes per, uh, four gigabytes per second. And we built, uh, of course, there's one gigabyte of DRAM on, on FPG as well, because that's what they come with. And we built a 20 node cluster networked over regular old Ethernet. And of course, these FPGAs are also connected to each other over our custom network. Our custom networks was sort of cool because we uh, took out most of the protocol related overhead. We built our own ex uh, hardware accelerated transport layer protocol on top of it, which gave us about half a microsecond latency anywhere in the network. So considering the flash chip itself had a latency of 80 microseconds, uniform latency all across the network, 100 microseconds was pretty good. First, because if we used, if we had used at the time, off-the-shelf flash storage devices with vendor-supplied flash translation layer, accessing local flash storage would have taken something like 300, 400 microseconds. And because if we, had go, if we go over regular old Ethernet to access remote nodes, going over Ethernet to access remote DRAM goes beyond 100 microseconds of latency. So that was pretty good. This is what the machine looks like. It looks very cool, but it's very loud and hot. <laughs> and it actually uh, allowed us to do a lot of research because such a cluster, such a architecture had not existed at the time and whatever we did was sort of new. It, 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 we did a lot of architectural work and ever since the architecture became sort of stable, uh, we have been moving on to applications, the key value stores, the graph analytics system, the, the key value databases, and of course, there's more to come if anyone is interested. So. That was the, the, con the meat of the talk. There are many more things to come in the future. I am focusing on the next generation of FluDBM because newer SSDs and FPGAs are much faster than what we had back in 2014 when we built it. Uh, prototype flash chips are aging because flash chips do have a lifetime. They typically, it, it's good if you can make them last beyond the typical uh, machine recycling time frame of three years, and we have used them since 2015 up to now, so we've been taking pretty good care of them, but they are aging. And of course, there are more applications that are of interest, bioinformatics that I'm doing right now, machine learning, because everyone wants to do it, and, and physical and biological simulations, with, because they're good with FPGAs. And of course, architectural exploration works, for example, better run times to, good run times for FPGAs and NAND flash storage, good programming systems to make the best use of these, these infrastructures, what operating system support we need for FPGs and NVM memory and whatnot. And if this is your cup of tea, then my email address, my office, I await your visit. Thank you. <laughs>
built by E people as opposed to CS people. So there's a lot of things that the tools try to give you freedom of. Uh, for example, the, you can, can or have to basically manage things like voltages on each of the pins. You have to manage clock frequencies and how sometimes you have to manage things like clock drift and all of that. So if you were trying to build an FPGA accelerator, and, and things like if you wanted to plug into PCIe, but the P actual PCIe protocol stuff isn't given to you, so you have to build it. So, so if, you wanted, if you bought an FPGA a few years ago and said, I'm going to build an accelerator on it using Verilog, which is the language, uh, you had to do things like write the PCIe protocol, because there's not a lot of those available online. You have to do timing analysis on the DRAM chip <laughs> data. So it, it, was, it was annoying. But it's become much better because uh, the, all these industry people are interested in it now. So for example, if you go to Amazon and rent an FPGA accelerated node from their Amazon F1 cluster, you can actually write OpenCL code, at least they claim, and it will synthesize all of the PCI stuff, memory stuff, network stuff, all that for you. But it, right, even with that, it's slightly, there's a lot of things going on. I could talk about this for hours. Uh, it's still sort of difficult to program because there's too much freedom in the architecture. If you tweak it very well, you will get really, really good performance, really, really low power consumption. Uh, but teaching it involves some effort. If you use the OpenCL stuff, if you use the, uh, what is what Xilinx called the high-level synthesis language, it's much easier to do, but sometimes harder to uh, optimize. It, it optimizes really well for simpler things like dense matrix matrix multiplication, but if you're doing dense matrix matrix multiplication, if that's all you're doing, you might as well go with GPUs. So did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. <laughs> Before we continue the work for the day, if you want to check in, it's again, right? <laughs> all lowercase. All right, any other questions? Go ahead. Oh, you said, uh, <coughs> since BrowSoft seems to have like amazing performance, superior performance, is there a commercial interest in yours in the system? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I haven't had a chance to. Uh, yeah, it, I, I built the graph and I've moved on. I'm, I'm still doing it, but I'm moving on to other things as well. So I, I haven't really thought too much about commercial stuff. Oh, I, like, I like companies haven't asked you to use to use the system for their calculations and stuff. You know what? Like, like the SDC and Samsung. Oh yeah, yeah. Samsung wants to use it. I think they actually have that code. So yes, I guess there is some interest. Cool. I have just paid too much attention. Awesome. To it. <laughs> yeah. How about the technologies used in the Bitcoin mining? You yes. know, in the Bitcoin or to the hashing, the yes. chips they are not much faster than before. Yes. So what's the different kind of technology they are using compared to what we have today? In terms of FPGAs, if Bitcoin miners uh, are using it. Yeah. Yeah, just about FPGA or the hardware that Bitcoin they are using. So, I think right now, if you're actually mining traditional Bitcoins, you actually you do have to go to ASICs, which is uh -huh. yeah. not FPGAs have this layer of abstraction between uh, 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 programmable hardware and the hardware that is programmed on it. But if you build ASICs, you're actually building the raw hardware. There, you can't change it. You can't reprogram it. You get it from a fat plant. Um, so. If you build A6, you get, depends on the process that you use, you can get multiple times frequency speed up and multiple, maybe an order of magnitude lower power consumption compared to FPGAs. So for, for Bitcoin, that's good because your interface is hardened, what you want it to do is harden, you, there's no requirement to change it anytime in the future. So if, you, if it makes sense for someone to put in the money to design an RTL, to go to a fabrication plant to actually build an ASIC application specific integrated circuit, for Bitcoin mining. Uh, so, how about our questions here? Can we build something like a stack for our question here? The hardware. Sorry? Can we build the specific hardware for Oh, the, uh, oh we just could. like ASSC for Bitcoin, right? We could. Uh, uh, it's, it takes a lot of effort. Basically, just a because a little. I mean, uh, I mean, what's the limit here? Is it uh, the effort or the money we don't have enough results to put it into? Uh, uh, let's sort of put it like this. We, uh, compared to GPUs, let's say it takes about 
five or six times the effort to program an FPGA. Compared to FPGAs, it takes further 10, 20 times the effort to program an ASIC because there's the requirements are much more stringent. You can't have clock issues. You can't have all that stuff. And of course, there's the money that you have to put in. There's a limited number of ch uh, the minimum number of chips you have to produce. Uh -huh. um, and you have to build your board around it because the, that chip by, your, by itself isn't going to do anything. So there's a lot of uh, work that needs to be done to get that working. But of course, people do do it. People who do uh, hardcore processor research actually do build their chips to actually fab out their chips, uh, run it at three gigahertz, but not maybe at three gigahertz, maybe a gigahertz, build their own board, uh, boot Linux on it, all that stuff. I've seen a group at MIT build a uh, few dozen core Linux-capable RISC-V processor, fab, fab it out, and then to run Linux on it. It took them four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I saw someone uh, crying in the hallway one day. <laughs> <laughs> they got a chip, they plugged it in, they ran it, power didn't come up, and there was a little bit of smoke. <laughs> no one could figure out what it was until they actually chopped off the top of the chip, put it under an electron microscope, and it turns out one of their uh, manifest files had a typo in it. So one of the 500 pins that were coming out of the chip, two of them had cables intersecting each other and there was um, you know, crosstalk. So that is something you can definitely do. <laughs> there are interests in, in this as well, but as um, Arvin, my advisor, had put it. I had done it five years ago, never again. Uh, <laughs> but I think he's actually forgot all of this and tried, wants to do it again, so his <laughs> mileage may vary. Hopefully, I won't cry in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope you don't. <laughs> um, I have a question about your blue DBM. Yes. Um, how robust is it? I, I think the, um, all the FPGA accelerated storage have are connected with the serial bus. Yes. Um, if one fails, um, is it does does the um, oh, the flash chip fails? Yeah. If one of the FPGA fails, is, does it still run the program or does it just? Die? If the FPGA fails, the flash is invisible to uh, the, the the node is invisible to the host software because you can't talk to it anymore. If the flash chips fail, we do have a rudimentary flash management layer, hardware accelerated flash management layer uh, built on it. If the flash chip fails, if a block fails, there is a map that takes care of all of this. Any more questions? Okay, I'm hearing the last one. Okay. So uh, it's really great that you can show lots of this performance um, improvement. So just from a, a security um, people's point of view, do you think this will create new attacks, like new side channel possibility? Absolutely. Like, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> because if, if, if we look at how BlueDBM is right now, we have an FPGA plugged into uh, uh, SSDs connected to the host over JTAG, which is the programming cable. Uh, right now, as it is implemented, any user on the machine can use the JTAG interface to look at the, what, what design is on FPGA, look at the values of any debug uh, infrastructure that's in there. If you're storing sensitive codes on the FPGA, it's visible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So there's absolutely, I mean, if, if someone wants to do hardware accelerated flash storage by uh, flash storage device with hardware FPGAs embedded into it, there's, I think, new security infrastructures that have to be thought of to manage all of this. Right, uh, but, 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 but maybe not just like this naive, um, for example, this, this engineering, the access control thing. Yeah. So probably not more fundamental. It's, it's, it, it's more of like you create this more specialized interaction between those components, but, but maybe oh, make it more, yeah, more easier, I mean, maybe like much easier to infer the pattern of the that data is, access. That is possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, for example, if, if, if you built an accelerator and you have to have a fall through in which if yes. the accelerator can, doesn't work for this particular data set, then it goes to the software. Exactly. The attacker could potentially look at figure out, what yeah. falls through and not to figure out what kind of accesses you're doing. Right, right, right. And, and, then, and then that'll be more fundamental, right? It's, it's like a trade-off, a fundamental trade-off. Probably. It, it, so if you want to make, uh, if you want, want to make things more, more specialized, it may create more chances, but, but if you want it to be more general so that it could be uh, less easier 
to be to to be um, attacked. Mm -hmm. But 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 in that case, probably your performance will be not be that that good. That is true. Yeah, I think that's something. So probably can lead to your next lecturing award if we. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for you <laughs> because you do no, security. Right. No, <laughs> we should cover. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but, but I will go first. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Yeah. Okay, so we should wrap up probably. I have one last question okay. about your t-shirt. I noticed your name is on it. Oh yes, uh, it's from uh, Reconfig, the tenth uh, Reconfig conference since it's uh, uh, since it started basically. They give you if because it was the tenth, it gives you a shirt with your name on it oh, if you wow. have a paper oh, there. Cool. I don't know if they still do it. It's held every year at Cancun, mm -hmm. so, so submit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. Let's thank this. Thanks. Great.